peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus. Amen. The text is from Exodus, the third chapter. And Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to the mountain of Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. The text. It's true of every Israelite, of every Hebrew, and of all their festival days, 10 of them, that they ask themselves, were you there? Were you there at the mountain of Horeb on the occasion of the burning bush? Were you there at Sinai? And all those people came, the mountain shook, the flame was there, and Moses went up the mountain. Were you there for the plagues? How many plagues were there? <laughs> ten, of course there were ten. There was blood in the Nile, frogs. Help me out here. That's good. Very good. This is great. It's mostly confirmation kids talking, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and hail and darkness and locusts and the firstborn. Were you there for that? If you're an Israelite, you would say yes on the basis of the DNA that still flows from the veins of, of Abraham to the veins of every Israelite. But there's another means by which you could say, yes, I was there. So if you're standing, here's what Paul says, and I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed with Moses through the sea, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The cloud is the pillar. They were all baptized, and they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, the food manna, the drink from the rock, the rock of ages. For that drink, that rock, was Christ. So let me ask you again, were you there for the burning bush, for the plagues, for passing through the sea, for going to the mountain of Sinai, for the plagues, for the baptism, for the pillar of cloud? The believers would answer, yeah, I was there. You and I would answer that. Because what is more legitimate the blood kinship or the spiritual kinship? Paul later explains, as do other apostles, that the spiritual kinship is the real one. You are the real holders of the real estate of Israel, the real estate that will last forever, because many people have been the holders of the geographical real estate. There, were, there was Greece, there was Rome, there was all the others that conquered and held those, those lands. Now it's even being contested this evening in Gaza and the Golan. It's not about that. It's about, were you there? And of course, the tone that went up, the voice that went up was, why is this happening to us? Why is this business of wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, why do we get thirsty? Why do we get hungry? Why do we clamor for this better bread? We want meat. The question occurs to us, 
Why is this all this happening? This appears that's reversals. Why all the pain? I was with a woman this morning who was suffering from cancer. Now she fell and broke her shoulder. Many times in the past during the visit, she's asked me why. Why is this happening? Why the cancer? Why the trouble with my kids? Why is it happening? What's the answer? Does God not see? Does he not hear? Does he not know? Or is God not powerful? Or is he not concerned? It seems like it has to be one or the other, doesn't it? Either he's not good or he's not powerful. Is God not good? God is very good. Is he not powerful to act? He's very powerful to act. So what's going on? What's the outcome? What's the outcome that God was looking for with these people all the way from the burning bush to the plagues to the manna to the water? Why all the complaining? And what was God up to? He was trying to draw them together. He was trying to communicate to them that my goal for you is family on this earth and forever. I'm also communicating judgment. I think in the United States of America, we have sort of dismissed God's role as judge. Christ's role as judge. Something has happened to the fear part, the fear and love God. Standing in awe. I think back on the days with my father, and if I didn't obey my father, I worried that night. Because he usually came home on Friday, and I was pretty good till Wednesday, but if I didn't obey my mother, I didn't do what my dad said when he left town for four days, I got worried by Friday because he was coming home. That was a proper fear. But then I graduated to a state of mind in which I respected my dad so much I didn't want to please him. Should there not be a proper fear of God? That we fear his judgment, we fear his wrath, we fear him coming down in a bolt of lightning, we fear him scattering like he did in the flood, like he did so many times? We believe that God orchestrates all right. But I wonder if we fear Friday. Dad's coming home. You got the work done that he asked you to do. Have we graduated to a point in our lives when we really want to please him? When we only use the Ten Commandments for a guide. We don't need it for a sharp bit. Even the mere we don't need to admire ourselves or scorn ourselves. Maybe just a guide, like a laser, like a rail along the road that we don't go off the road when it's slippery or muddy. That's what he's looking for. You know, Moses spent 40 years in Egypt, and he had the best life anybody ever had. He was the child of the Pharaoh, or the Pharaoh's daughter. I think that Moses was the first guy who ever graduated from the University of Cairo because he had everything the Pharaoh could buy. But he also had the nurture of his mother. She schooled him, and this is a real Hebrew. This is a real child of God. God will deliver us. I know we've been here for a long time, but 
Put your hope and trust in the Lord. And he went out one day, and the Egyptian taskmaster was beating on a Hebrew slave, and he killed the Egyptian. And the next day he walked out to the same place, and the Hebrew said, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Moses started to run. I think he ran on foot. He ran all the way around the top of the Red Sea by Ezion Geber and went to the far side of the Red Sea into the land of Midian. And he chased sheep for 40 years. That's a long time for chasing sheep. I've done a little shepherding, not a lot. But cattlemen and shepherds don't get along that good. And Moses was a humble shepherd for 40 years. The son-in-law of Jethro, he married a Midianite, an ancient relative of Abraham. Then when he went around again the top of the Red Sea and came to the Sinai side, still following sheep, there was this bush. And it burned and burned and burned and was not consumed. Moses said, I better take a closer look. This is some kind of phenomenon. And he wish, walked up to the bush, and the voice said, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. It would scare the bejeebers out of me. Take off your shoes. And the bush wasn't consumed. And that same voice said, I want you to go now where you ran from 40 years ago. It's time to bring my people out. And I want you to do it. Moses gave four kinds of excuses. Ah, da, da, I stutter, I can't talk good. <laughs> God said, enough. After Moses thought up four reasons why he couldn't, shouldn't go, God said, Moses, just keep quiet. You're going. This is what I want you to do. Now come the plagues that you guys know. And then finally, the death of the firstborn. And now Pharaoh and his people pay them to leave. That's where they got the gold for the golden calf. So what's up with you? What's up with us? Is God not powerful? Is he not good? Is he both powerful and good? And he intends now or later to wake us up to the fact that there is judgment. Some of it comes on this earth and some of it comes forever in a hell of fire. But he wants to draw us in his family and he will do anything. He will give the life of his son draw us into his family and to draw people and nations together so they can live in harmony. That's his intention. He will do both. He will judge, he will condemn, he will draw his people into his kingdom and family and he intends for these stories and this evidence in the word that it be a warning and an invitation. If you and I really believe this, if the people of this country really believe this, they'd be a little frightened. Maybe they'd be a lot frightened. They would flock toward harmony and getting along. They'd flock toward the harmony and the anticipation of an abundant life now life with the Lord forever. These stories are not just bedtime stories. These stories are for us to contemplate, to think in real time. What's going on here? And how then should we live according to the instructions provided in plain language in the book? Let us then do this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Peace of God that passes our understanding, bind our hearts, and godly respite.